Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord. Good morning. Oh, 
What a delight it is to actually hear a response to that. <laughs> uh, I, could, like, I could stand here and cry. Welcome, welcome to Heidelberg, and welcome to everyone who is continuing to join us via live stream. We are so delighted to have you all here. Um, we are Heidelberg UCC. Uh, we are an open and affirming church in York, Pennsylvania. And by that, we declare ourselves to be welcoming into full membership and participation in the body of Christ, persons of every race, language, age, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression, physical or mental ability, and economic or marital status. We are um, gathered here, of course, for our first time and ever mindful of what is going on outside of our doors and in the world. So we thank everyone. You can, obviously, it looks and feels a lot different in here than normal. Um, there's been a lot of work that's gone into this, and thank you to all of those who have done that. Um, and we thank you all for your willingness to wear your masks. We ask everybody to just continue to be mindful to those things that were spelled out um, in the covenant, which happens to be on the second page of your bulletin. Um, we'd ask everybody to, to just let's keep each other safe so we can keep coming in here. It is, it is a wonderful thing to be here. So we are thinking particularly of those who are not with us yet today, um, wishing them well. Uh, we lift up especially Ronald Bruce, who is actually in Virginia this weekend. There's going to be a memorial service for his father tomorrow. He did send me a text this morning and said thank you, thank you to everyone who has offered their expressions of sympathy and sent cards, and uh, he and the family appreciate that very much. Um, we would uh, point your, we're going to point just briefly, little sales pitch here. We do have, we have some technology things that we've been working on pretty hard. We've gotten a lot of the live stream equipment in place. We have a temporary television set that we're gonna be using for some videos here today. And what we're working on moving forward is we have a bigger, we have a 75 inch TV that is on its way here. And what that's gonna enable us to do is as we continue to meet in person and also via the live stream, some folks who aren't comfortable coming in yet are gonna be submitting their pieces for us by video. So having the TV is going to allow us to show what they contribute to the service at the same time that we're still in the sanctuary. Uh, we used some leftover money from the live stream, uh, from the audio equipment to help purchase our live stream equipment. We're also using some of the money from that for the TV, but we are turning out to be around $250 short for the cost of the TV. So if anyone out there feels a special, um, urge to give a contribution to that, we would welcome that as well. But uh, hopefully we'll be in really good shape in terms of our equipment, and thanks so much to Ira for all his expertise and help in coordinating that. Um, thank you all for your continued giving. We uh, are happy to accept your offering here via the envelopes, also via the Give Plus app. Ira usually sticks a link to that in the live stream at this point. And, uh, for, for those folks at home. There's also, there was a Neighbors in Need offering that was announced in the newsletter, and the day for that was going to, is today. It is today within the UCC. We do not have the special envelopes for that with us today, but we would say that if you're interested in making a special contribution to that cause, you are welcome to either mark something with a piece of paper with that today, or moving forward, of course, we would accept things throughout the month. With that, if we could quiet our hearts and please join me in the call to worship. Long ago, a vineyard was planted. The ground was prepared and all was made ready, but the vines grew wild. The ground was unable to support the wild grapes. What happened in that place of promise? people who forgot the one who planted the vineyard. They chose their own ways and failed. Let us turn again to the Lord, who again plant, prune, and cause us to grow in faithfulness. Let us open our hearts to God, trusting in God's ways and God's word.
Sorry you have to listen to me so much today. Um, Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. It's the parable of the wicked tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you ever read in the scriptures, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. I'm undoubtedly dating myself, but uh, it is so nice to be able to uh, look out from behind this guard all shield here uh, and uh, be able to see people. And this shield is to protect people from my overactive spitting uh, and anybody else's. So uh, uh, we were very happy to uh, have Wick put this together for us. Uh, and have it available for our services. It is, as I said, so nice to see more human beings. Uh, I I frankly don't know how some of my colleagues have managed all this time uh, speaking into a camera with no other humans around. Uh, At least I've had, you know, four or five, six people here uh, around me, and again, I I am exceedingly thankful to all those who have helped and uh, to our faithful organist, Mary Jane, who has been here every Sunday uh, through this pandemic uh, and offering up her talents to us. This is a difficult parable, perhaps. It's one that we don't like in any number of ways. Am I going to try to tell you what it means precisely? No, you know I never do. (laughs) Uh, Because it's largely up uh, to all of us to make sense of it as it fits into our lives. I perhaps am going to raise more questions today uh, than I do answers. But we'll see where we get. While sorting through the mail one day when I was a pastor at Grace, I came across a letter that was addressed to the owner of the business, followed by the church address. Well, needless to say, I opened it. And the letter informed me that we were entered in a drawing for a luxury car. And I pondered that briefly. And I thought, what if we win the drawing? 
What if we win the drawing? Would I be eligible for the prize? And even more important, would God mind if I passed myself off as the owner of this business? So I said that happened at Grace, but it could easily, just as easily have happened here at Heidelberg or any other congregation because mail comes in to churches all the time, just like that. But let's face it, all too often we forget who owns the business here. We forget who's in charge of the church. And I think this is part of the point of Jesus' parable of the vineyard. In the writings of the prophet Isaiah, the vineyard was a symbol of Israel itself. But the Israelites decided they were going to be their own vineyard instead. They declared their independence and rejected God's ownership. They would decide whether or not to grow, what kind of fruit to produce, and that fruit would be their own, not God's. And so I think Jesus is challenging us, challenging us by changing the details of the Old Testament parable, but the point remains the same. The vineyard was God's exclusive and rightful possession but the ownership of the vineyard is in dispute. Those who have been called to service by God have decided to overthrow God's claims and keep the vineyard for themselves. The point plainly applies to the church of Jesus Christ. Whose vineyard is this anyway? Whose is this vineyard? Whose church is this? Who owns this house? Who calls the shots around here? I jokingly said to one of our members uh, when I came in this morning, I said, well, where do you want this, boss? And the person rightfully responded to me, I'm not the boss. So who is the boss? Who makes the decisions? The owner or the tenants? Does God as owner or do we as the tenants? In spite of the fact that most Christians are reasonably decent people, it's not always clear to whom the church belongs. Somewhere between one-fourth and one-third of the population of this planet supposedly take their marching orders from Jesus and claim that they are Christians. If that is true, my friends, how can the world be in its present condition? How can it be in its present condition? I happen to be play, uh, watching an old, old, 48-year-old <laughs> uh, program of the Carol Burnett Show just last night. <clears throat> and at the end of the show, she said something like, let's all fight pollution I can't read my hand scratch. Uh, let's all fight pollution <clears throat> as though our lives depended on it. That was back in 1972. We haven't listened all that well in any number of ways to the orders that we have been given in terms of taking care of this planet. If one out of every three or four people on the planet Earth were living out the teachings of Jesus Christ, I can't believe that we would be posed on the brink of ecological disaster, or that people would be killing each other in unthinkable numbers, or that starvation would still be a global problem, or that the sidewalks of every one of our major cities would be littered with homeless people, or that children would be dying for the lack of a few pennies worth of medicine, something, my friends, has gone screwy, awry, it ain't good, whatever words you want to use. And I'm not looking, oh, I'm not overlooking all the good that the church has accomplished in the past 2,000 years. But let's face it, our record has been spotty at best, and very often our memories are poor. There was a period of time in history which was known 
and it was a relatively long period of time. I don't remember precisely, 400 years maybe, 300 years. And what was it called? The Dark Ages. Probably because we, the tenants, weren't listening to the owner's ideas. So our record has been spotty. And if it hadn't been so spotty, uh, and if our communities and our nations uh, hadn't been under the thrall of something, we wouldn't be in the mess that we are in today that we can no longer afford to be ambivalent about who owns this vineyard. We've got to start staking out some places and say, these kinds of things have to be done. Things are only going to get much worse if we do not acknowledge that the only landlord of this vineyard is Jesus the Christ. Now, I'm not describing a cure today, just issuing a reminder. It's not enough for the church to be a people, even if we become a well-organized, respected people. We are not just a people. We are the people who belong to whom? To God. It's not enough for the church to be a body, not even a cooperative, loving body who takes care of its own. We are not called to be a body. We are called to be the body of Christ. It's not enough for the church to be a community, not even if we are a growing community with all sorts of programs going on, live streams, whatever. We are not called to be just a community. We are called to be the community of the Holy Spirit. As I said earlier, I don't have a quick fix or an easy formula to keep us on track. I don't have answers to many of the questions that I've raised. All I can offer is the humble suggestion that we remember who it is who owns this vineyard in which we live? Who planted us here? Who nurtured us through the years? Who has the first claims on the fruit of our obedience? Who has the right to prune away the wasted efforts and the unhealthy growth? Into whose spirit are we baptized? For whose word do we listen? At whose table? Do we gather? And today we will be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion. And just an amusing uh, 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 reflection, when I was on my seminar abroad uh, in England uh, back in 1972, uh, we were in England. And somehow we got talking about Worldwide Communion Sunday. And our hosts kind of looked at as if looked at us as if we had three heads. And they basically said, We have no idea what you're talking about. Absolutely none. Later on, you're going to hear more about World Communion Sunday, because that's what's going to be in the on the video. But it's interesting. At least it was interesting to all of us that something that we considered to be worldwide was not, at least in the eyes of the British people, it was not something worldwide. And one of the uh, hosts said as we were leaving, well, we'll be thinking about you the first Sunday in October as you celebrate and maybe we'll celebrate with you worldwide communion. As I said, there is no quick fix. Those of you who have been here at Heidelberg for the last, how many years? Five, six, seven years, eight years, I don't know. Uh, what have we done on World Communion Sunday? This area here in the middle has been decked out with a table of breads, and we literally feasted on it. It was important because we had breads from all over the world, not just the United States. 
but various kinds of bread. So how we look at World Communion Sunday, and you'll hear Jim Antal talk about it, uh, the origins of it, and how important it can be. Sometimes after the most honest searching of scriptures, we are still going to end up on different sides of various issues. I know that. But sometimes after the most earnest prayers for guidance, we will come to a better understanding. As we look at things as they are affecting us today, we can find better answers. I am convinced, even though I have perhaps been kind of a downer in some, in some respects this morning, I'm still convinced that as we live out our Christian calling, as individuals or as Christians clump together in congregations and committees, as we go about the work of this household of faith, we must pause again and again and again to ask ourselves, Who's the leader here? And who are the followers? Who provides the vision for the life of this household? Indeed, just whose house is this? Amen. As I said, I want to share with you, it's a seven minute video. I think Jim has a lot of good things to say to us. Uh, in addition to giving us some history, his uh, take on, uh, on World Communion Sunday. World Communion Sunday, he'll tell you that, but I'll just say it now anyway, started back in 1933, a time of despair throughout the world. We live in a time where there is despair throughout our world. So without further uh, introduction, I will have us look at the video that Jim Antal has provided. Grace and peace to you in the name of our still speaking God, who loves us just the way we are and loves us too much to let us stay that way. World Communion Sunday was initiated by Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh. The year was 1933, another time of deep distress and worldwide turmoil. When global anxiety and personal fear ruled the day and the future was anything but clear. That time of despair and challenge also launched the Civilian Conservation Corps, a massive employment program that sought to protect our natural resources and connect the American public to nature's beauty. 1933 saw a third historic event, also an expression of desperation produced by the Great Depression. Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany. The vision of those who initiated World Communion Sunday was to heighten our awareness of the unity of Christians around the world. Their hope was to set aside a Sunday every year when congregations would focus on the beliefs, values, and opportunity for service Christians share, whatever their denomination and wherever they might be throughout the world. From its inception, World, Community, World Communion Sunday recognized that to fulfill this vision, Christians would need to get to know one another. We would need to hear each other's stories, to walk in each other's shoes, to move beyond our denominational distinctions, and to affirm our oneness in Christ. This vision was quickly adopted by the whole of the Presbyterian Church, and soon thereafter, the National Council of Churches 
and that continues to be recognized by many congregations and most denominations throughout the United States and around the world. As we gather this year for World Communion Sunday in a time of worldwide pandemic, I believe God is calling the church to expand our recognition of unity. It's time for the church to celebrate not only the unity of the Christian church, but the unity and interdependence of all of God's creation. In Genesis 9, God makes a covenant, not only with humans, but with all living creatures, and not only with those that are alive today, but with all future generations. In John 3.16, we hear that God so loved the world, not just humans. As churches across the world come together today to recognize World Communion Sunday, the church has an opportunity to affirm the interconnectedness of all of creation and the life-preserving importance of biodiversity. For people who believe in God, preserving, protecting, and restoring God's creation is not a matter of ideological debate. People who believe in God recognize, as Psalm 24 tells us, that the earth is the Lord's. It's not ours to wreck. This year, World Communion Sunday arrives at a time of pandemic, unemployment, isolation, and discouragement. A time when we are facing our most consequential election and an unknown future. In this moment, the church has the opportunity to inspire the faithful to embrace our interdependence with all of creation. Let us also lift up our grief as we lament the ways we are destroying God's creation. Let us acknowledge the ways climate change is amplifying every kind of injustice, whatever injustice your church cares about, climate change is making it worse. The world already has millions of climate refugees, and in a few years, they will number hundreds of millions. Extreme flooding wreaks havoc on the world's food supply. Extreme droughts are, ex are rendering huge landscapes uninhabitable. Unregulated fracking, toxic coal ash pits, and failed pipelines are poisoning wells and water supplies. And if you're living in America as a black or brown or indigenous person, the chances are that you've been dealing with a public health crisis all your life because you live near a refinery or a toxic waste jump dump. While all of this is enormously challenging, we are also living in a time when humanity has all the solutions we need. Can we come together to address the greatest moral crisis humanity has ever faced? Can we be guided by the vision of unity that the worldwide church lifts up today? Can we hear and follow God's call to embrace the unity of creation by implementing the climate solutions that are already available now? I believe we can. I believe that this is what discipleship in the 21st century looks like. And I invite you and your congregation to join me and countless others as we preserve, protect, and restore God's great gift of creation. Amen.
friends, <clears throat> siblings of On This World Communion Sunday, we are invited to gather around this table wherever you may be, be it here in the sanctuary, be it in the comfort of your homes, wherever. This is not Heidelberg's table. It's not the table of the United Church of Christ. Rather, <clears throat> this is God's table. And we are, each one of us, invited as honored guests. On World Communion Sunday, as we and thousands of Christians around the world gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are reminded that this table stretches beyond all borders and all walls. Today, we gather with Christians around the world who are also celebrating this meal today, with Palestinians, and Colombians, and Syrians, and Guatemalans, and Germans, and Kenyans, and Koreans, and Chinese, and people of no nation whatsoever. This table does not ask for citizenship status, nor any other status that we could come up with. This is a table where all the languages of our lips and our hearts are spoken and understood. This table has no room for weapons or hatred, but is ever extending to make more room for anyone who seeks a place here. Let us pray. The Lord be with us. Let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Creating God, source of our being, we give you thanks and praise you for you have brought forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. In the beginning, you created people in your likeness. In your likeness, you created people who multiplied and became many, people of many genders, races, nationalities, and abilities. You created the world and all that is in it without borders or walls, and you called it good. Jesus, our sibling, born of Mary in a stable in Palestine, you confronted the powers and principalities of your time and welcomed as your friends those whom society had cast aside. For love and liberation of your people, you risked your life and were executed by the brokenness of empire. Yet even death could not put an end to the love you embody. Out of death, you arose to new life to live again among your people. With joy, we celebrate what you have done, and with dedication, we follow you, transformed by your love, as we proclaim the mysteries of our faith. And let us pray together that prayer, which Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was arrested by the authorities, he was gathered in an upper room to celebrate Passover, a story of liberation. He was there with his closest friends. He took a piece of bread, he blessed it, broke it, and shared it with his friends, saying, take, eat, this is the bread of life broken for you. And in the same manner also after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we would pray, O oh God, pour out your spirit on this bread and this cup through these ordinary gifts that sustain us and our bodies, Nourish us and transform us 
that we might remember that we belong to each other and to you. Through this remembering, let us be reconciled to each other and to you. Through this remembering, may we tear down all boundaries and walls that we have built. Through this remembering, may all peoples in all places and times be united in you as we share this meal. Every time that we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the power of Jesus' death and resurrection until he comes. Friends, these elements which are here, these elements which you have brought with you today from your homes, from your gardens, wherever, these are the elements that we share to remember the life, the ministry, the mission of Jesus the Christ. And so I would say to all of us that these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Since if you have it right at your own beck and call, merely take the bread and eat. It is the bread of life given for you. And the juice, liquid, whatever you may happen to have with you today, <clears throat> let us drink this in remembrance of the saving grace given to us by our Savior, Jesus the Christ. <laughs> And let us give thanks, O oh God, our mystery. You bring us to life. You call us to freedom and move between us with love. Having been nourished at your table, may we go into your wondrous and diverse world to tear down walls of exclusion, to confront powers and principalities, to live and love boldly in the promise of your resurrection. Amen.
Richardson. And the table will be wide and the welcome will be wide and the arms will open wide to gather us in and our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust there is enough and we will come unhindered and free and our aching will be met with bread and our sorrow will be met with wine. And we will open our hands to the feast without shame. We will turn toward each other without fear. And we will give up our appetite for despair and we will taste and know of delight. And we will become bread for a hungering world and we will become drink for those who thirst. And the blessed will become the blessing and everywhere will be the feast. I was remiss during the communion service, and so I will try to make amends uh, by, by saying it now. Um, <clears throat> I had it written down, but not where I uh, found it. We need to remember in prayer uh, all of those who are suffering from COVID-19, whether it has affected them directly, as it has our friend Ronald, or as it has affected our president, Donald Trump. So, in our prayers, let us lift up all those we know, and let us lift up all those that, all those that we don't know. And may God's blessing rest upon each and every one of us, as we seek to be God's faithful people, people who have empathy, people who care, people who reach out and minister in the name of the life that we just celebrated in the sacrament of Holy Communion. I'm going to do the benediction. <clears throat> And then I'm going to uh, invite you to do something strangish, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, but then this is Heidelberg, so why not? Uh, at the end of the benediction, what I am going to suggest, if you feel comfortable doing it, if you don't feel comfortable doing it, that's okay. What I'm going to suggest is that I will say the benediction, and then when it comes time to do the American Sign Language piece, be with you, that we all stand up, face the camera in the back, and we can all do the peace to everybody who happens to be watching and listening. So I'll do the benediction, I'll go through the directions, the, the motions uh, when I get to the end of the benediction. How's that? <clears throat> Creator God, as we leave this time of worship and we return to our homes, our now familiar COVID-19 routines, be they watching the live stream in our pajamas or wherever, may your spirit open our eyes anew to the vastness and splendor of your beauty all around us. May we hear and smell and see and touch your glory evident in all of your creation. And above all, let us see your beauty, even in the brokenness of our brothers and sisters, all of them created in your image and waiting to experience that redemption that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We go now to love and serve our Lord. Amen. And so I would have you, uh, well, I'll go through the motions once again. Uh, other way. <laughs> Peace. Be, excuse me, be with you. So if you are comfortable, stand up. 
face the camera and we will say in American Sign Language, peace be with you. Peace. Be with you. See you next Sunday.